Today I'm speaking to Matan Gavish. Uh, Matan is the CEO of Fit Hit, Inc., 5,000 fastest growing companies in the US, and former Israeli special ops commander. He's an author, speaker, and thought leader. Matan is a former Krav Maga officer for a special ops unit in the Israeli Defense Forces, in charge of training Krav Maga, close combat, and counterterrorism to hundreds of special ops soldiers. Matan has trained U.S. Navy SEALs, U.S. Army Rangers, and is actively working with NYPD Tactical Training Unit in design, practice, and implementation of Krav Maga to the New York Police Academy. Matan has been featured as an expert in various media channels, including National Geographic, CBS, Fox, Anderson Cooper, the British BBC, Shape Magazine, New York Times, Women's Day, uh, Washington Post, The Inquisitor, Player Magazine, and many more. With over 15 years of military, law enforcement, and civilian training experience in the U.S. and around the globe, Martin Gavish has a solar reputation for being one of the leading Krav Maga experts in the world. In addition to Krav Maga, Matan holds eight fitness certificates and has a BA from Columbia University in New York City. Matan, welcome. Thank you, Kate. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we've been training for a little while. And uh, why the reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you is because you're, um, you know, you've trained thousands of women in self-defense. Um, crime levels in New York are increasing rapidly, especially over the past couple of years. And I just want the listeners to go away from this or to come away from this conversation with tips and advice on how to feel and be more safe outside on the streets and on public transportation. So I guess the first question I have for you is, what is the most important piece of advice you can give to women uh, in New York and everywhere to feel and be more safe? The first thing that needs to uh, that needs to materialize, the first few things that need to materialize, is uh, taking active actions to increase one's awareness everywhere that they are, but specifically in places that are uh, that are more vulnerable today. And places that are more vulnerable, they change over time. You just gotta you know, keep your finger on the pulse and see what is happening today. We know that today, at least in New York City, but not just in New York City, okay? We, we train in New York. We got a, a place in Los Angeles too, and we see kind of similar behaviors happening both there and here. Uh, public transportation has been a place of increased violence. So when we talk about being aware, the first thing is to, is to you know, pay attention to what are what could be some like soft spots or or more vulnerable areas within the world of public transportations, right? So mm -hmm. staircases, for example, that's that's a big one. Um, uh, elevators, right? When you get closed, you get closed off, that's another big one. Uh, anywhere on the platform, okay? There is, there is very unique vulnerabilities to people on the platform. And then inside the train, right? What happens in, when you're inside the subway or inside a moving vehicle and you can't really get out of there. So every single one of those have their own um, their own unique unique vulnerabilities. And what women and and people in general should do is always assess, just use common sense, because common sense actually solves a whole lot of problems when it comes to when it comes to awareness. You don't have to be a genius to do it. You just have to go through the process of thinking about it. So if you're standing in the platform, for example, and you have to actively choose to focus on what is happening around you as opposed to Looking at your phone, getting into a place where you're you're very internal. You're you're in your own thoughts. You're thinking about what you're going to do next or what you're going to do tomorrow, and you don't actually pay attention to a very fast moving environment. And clearly, you're going to become more vulnerable. So the first action that needs to happen is to become present. Okay, become present in the moment and see what happens, and then actively ask yourself the question: Is there anything here that makes me feel uncomfortable? Now, just by asking yourself that question, you will start seeing things and recognizing things that you may have not even recognized if you didn't take the time to ask yourself that question. And what are those things that make you feel uncomfortable? We call them red flags. A red flag is any anything, right? Any behavior that doesn't quite fit the time or the location and, and it raises an emotion for you, okay? So one is to decide to be present, right? That's, I guess, one major tip to decide to be present. The second major tip is to trust your own intuition if things make you feel uncomfortable. And if you are present and your intuition is telling you that something is off, the third one 
is to act on it. And the great thing about acting on a feeling before things become violent is you don't actually face the assault. You don't actually face the violent. You act in a preemptive way to, dis- to create just as much distance as you can from the red flag, from the thing that raised the, the, the suspicion level for you. Now, here's the beauty of, uh, of that. And let me know if I'm going a little too long over this. Oh, here forward. Yeah, but here's, here's, the, here's the beauty of it, right? Our brain is, has this magic ability to analyze um, certain things in a way that's, that's nonlinear. So it goes from A to Z, and it skips all the steps in the middle to just give you a feeling. And any woman that's listening to this, if you ever felt somebody was creepy, and I think everyone knows what creepy means, but you couldn't quite say why you felt that he was creepy. He didn't say anything or he didn't do anything. He just he was just there. And you had a creepy feeling or a creepy vibe from him, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is your brain doing something that is very um very primal, very, very old. Okay, it's part of our like really old survival mechanism like where your brain analyzes, yeah, it analyzes nonverbal cues and body language and it puts all of those together and it all happens in the back. So it's not in the front. Like you don't, you're not, you're not, you're not taking um, a conscious effort to recognize and label all of these things. This is happening in the background and the result of that is a feeling, okay? And that feeling is that feeling of creepy or if you ever, I can't even tell you, I've, I've worked with so many women that's been assaulted. And one of the most recognizable sentences that I kept hearing over and over again over the years was, uh, I had a bad feeling about him, but I didn't do anything about it. I had a bad feeling about him. Right. So what is that bad feeling, right? Why did you have the bad feeling? They can't even tell you. Like they wouldn't know why they had that bad, that bad feeling. Right. Do you think it's, it's because of experiences or do you think it's that innate feeling of well you have that so you're... that's the thing so your brain has the capacity to give you that that red flag unfortunately today there's two things that are happening one we prevent the input of stimuli from actually reaching our brain to give us the feeling right by looking at our phones or having headphones on so our senses is how we collect information and if we block those senses uh you know by looking at the floor the entire time so our eyes don't see things so we can't analyze any information and we block our ears so they so you can't hear anything then you're not going to get the feeling and then the attack or whatever it is, you know, it came out of nowhere. But, right. but nothing really comes out of nowhere. There's always, there's almost always signs that something is off. And we just have to make ourselves aware, right? So the first part is to have that conversation in your head about being present in the moment and about allowing yourself to take in the, the environment. The second thing is to be very mindful of the emotions that you get through that process, right? Is anything feels off? Right? Is anything? Do I do you get a creepy vibe about anything or anyone? And the third part is, though, it's really just to take action, and the, the action is to distance yourself as far as possible from that situation. As we're going into more active, right? Because you asked specifically for five mm-hmm. things. So if mm-hmm. we go to number four and number five, and number four and number five would be, well, what happens if you cannot distance yourself from that situation and it turns violent? Okay. Right. Or and, on the other hand, what would happen? If you are in a situation, somebody is acting out or acting crazy, mm-hmm. and you don't know if distancing yourself from the situations will actually create more attention to you um, than staying in that situation. That's, that's a really good uh, thing. So, so here's the thing. You cannot control what bad guy is doing. And I think women live under the impression that they can, that it's their reaction that brought violence on them, or it's their behavior that brought sexual assault on them. And that's just not the case, you know? Like, these people come pre-screwed up, pre-violent, you know? Mm-hmm. They're, 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 these rapists were rapists before they've actually committed the first rape. They just haven't acted on it yet. And there's nothing a woman could do to bring it out of that person. Now, if you're a person who's looking to do damage, who, who would you, who are you most likely to choose? Are you more likely to choose the aware person that is clearly walking away or running away and distancing right. themselves from you? Or are you going to attack the person who doesn't even know you're there, who is so busy in their own internal stuff that they're not even going to know when the first punch hits them and the second punch. And by the time they realize they're in a fight, it's already over. Awareness is the way out of, of most situations. I, I call what you've mentioned like that, that behavior, right? Like when like some, some people would actually choose timidity okay like this is like 
when we choose to not look, not observe, not be aware on purpose because we don't want to draw attention to ourselves. And when you right. do that, what you actually do is you're actually increasing. It's counterproductive. Your right? victimization, so you actually, you your actually victimization look like level. A victim. Exactly, yeah. right? Like if it's just put yourself in the shoes of the bad guy, right? Who does the bad guy want to want to, right? Bad guys look for weak links, the weakest links. And the weakest link isn't the person who is super aware and taking action. Right. Okay. And then one of the things that you highlighted during your seminar was um, an FBI research. And it was about if assaults are at random or if there's something that attackers are looking for. Um, could you tell us something about that research? Yeah. So this research was done by Grayson uh, et al. So it was a university research first. And then the, the FBI has, has been using it to, uh, uh, to to throw some more analysis on top of that. But it was it was mm-hmm. university research first. Okay. And it was a great it was a great research that basically challenged the idea of random assaults. Because we hear about random assaults all the time. A woman was attacked randomly, a person was slashed randomly, a woman punched in the face randomly, random, random, random. Mm -hmm. And in reality, um, so these these researchers wanted to know if attacks were actually random. So the the way that they tested it is they put a bunch of cameras out on a busy New York City street, and they've captured uh, 60 people just walking. And it was 50, and, and the people were random. So it was a random selection of people. And uh, each video was about 15 seconds. And then they took those 60 videos and showed it to the most horrible degenerate people in prison, um, you know, the rapists, the murderers, the ones that are never leaving. And they've asked them, hey, you are a terrible individual. Who would you assault from this random group of people? Right. And if it was really random, then we would see some form of a random distribution in their in their decision making. But what they end up finding out is that all of these bad guys honed in on a very small group of people. The bad guys kept choosing the same victims over and over and over again. And it didn't even take them 15 seconds. They, they chose it in seven seconds or less. We call it the seven seconds rule. People get targeted to be victimized within seven seconds or less. That's incredible. Yeah. And what, what were the things that they, you know, what were the characteristics of the victims that they choose? What was super interesting about it, it, it wasn't any of the things that we would normally think it is, like age or size or what they were wearing or the time of day, right? Like we have all these things that we think, all right, people choose us because of those obvious things. When they look deeper, what they found was is that the bad guys honed in on, on these people that were the least coordinated, okay? It was, it was non-synchronous movement that was uh, okay. one of the key elements, right, to the, to the way that they walk. And uh, the overall athleticism, okay, which is, is translated into like lengths of stride, uh, um, shifting in weight, uh, the way that they walked. So, you know, as we read through this research, we come to the conclusion that people that are uh, the least coordinated and the least athletic would be the ones that would more likely to be picked right to be right because they were probably uh, least likely to run away or get away from them i guess or well there's two things right so the way we look the way we look at it right there's two things that bad people are also worried about right what are bad people worried about they don't want to get caught and they don't want to get hurt so they're probably most likely to choose victims that are the least likely to get them caught or to get them hurt these are the two big things right for the bad right, guys they are scared of that too of course okay. they're not yeah it's good yeah. to think about um perpetrators as people who can be worried about things too right? well that <laughs> and that's human. right and and i can tell you that many times you know bad guys are portrayed as this uh, this like unbeatable like entity and that's just not the case they're usually just people with you know one thing that's a little off about them but there's just as fragile and just as as vulnerable as any other person Uh, and sometimes even more you just need to believe it right when you go into an engagement that you can that you can cause that damage uh yeah so that's what so that's why they found out which is why one of the reasons that fitted exists is to equip women with the coordination and the strength and the athleticism not to just handle violence when it happens but to actually remove them from the obvious pools of victims that a bad guy might be looking for right let's just take the bullseye off their backs and if something happens and they do get picked, because this is not, of course, an insurance policy, right? These are all by percentages. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, first you make them less likely to get assaulted. And if they do, they're way more likely to come out okay on the other side because of the skill set right. that comes with that. I mean, the first uh, objective is to run away. And yes. the second is to be able to, when you do get into a fight, to be able to defend yourself. Yeah, I would say, you know, running away is the best option. Negotiating your way out is, all, like, if there's something you can give them to make the whole thing go away, then you should give it. Like, there's nothing of material that is worth the physical altercation. Mm-hmm. Um, those things can be replaced. So 
we always recommend for people to think about their well-being first. Okay, and, right. but but if but that's not always an option, right? Sometimes the violence starts at a choke. There's right. no. There's no communication. There's no running, there's no running away. There's right. no there's no negotiation. Yeah, you have to turn. Yeah, you have to switch on violence. Yes, because um, the other thing that I was yes. um, thinking about is that I um, work at a breadline, the St. Francis Church on 31st, um, every Monday and Friday from 6 to 8 a.m. And 85 percent of 300 to 400 homeless people who are in that breadline are mentally ill and they should be in a place or a facility that takes care of them and you know takes care of their needs but they don't they're 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 on the streets so it's difficult to prepare for an attack by somebody who's mentally ill because you can't predict it right well here's the thing i would mentally ill people would probably give more signs more red flags Ah, right. Than than a person who really thinks through their their victimization, right? right. Like if you know if you know just by being around them that they're crazy, that's the red flag right there, mm-hmm. and you can distance yourself from that. Okay. Now this yeah. can lead to a whole other debate on how you solve crime by reducing uh, the mental illness around the the homeless population, mm-hmm. but that's not a problem that FitHit is ready to invest time and effort into. Right, <laughs> that's another person's job. Right, and when it comes to you know weapons, we all we've all heard about you know pepper spray uh, that women can take with them in their bags. Do you have any advice on other types of you know weapon like items that women can pop in their bags when they go someplace? Yeah, um, none of those things in my opinion are uh, helpful if you there if it's in your bag because things happen really fast by the time you look for anything inside a bag you've Unzip been hit bag, multiple right. times you've been you've been broken you need to start defending your face which is what you're going to do even if you're not overthinking it right you get mm-hmm. hit your hands are going to go up there's no person in the world that's going to shift through their bag while they're being pummeled with punches or what we've seen recently in the subway station being pummeled with a hammer or being pummeled with um, you know, this poor woman who was assaulted on Third Avenue with a crowbar and died, right? right. Like, do I you see this woman now going through her bag and trying to find the gadget that was supposed to save her life? Yeah, it, it, just, of... it just doesn't work unless it's in your hand, ready right. to go. And here's the thing. What is pepper spray? I, I recommend to everybody, do a quick YouTube search. You know, pepper spray doesn't work on people. And you'd see... The, mm-hmm. the strongest type of pepper spray, which is the one usually used by police, which you don't have access to. Yet. You don't buy their stuff. You buy something that's weaker. Mm-hmm. And you see police officers spraying people. But if they're on drugs or if they're crazed, uh, it doesn't stop them. And the reason it doesn't stop them is because pepper spray creates pain. And pain is very subjective. Pain reaction is subjective to people. Some people, pain will stop them, but some people, it won't. Some people might enjoy pain and see that, think that it's a reward. Um, some people have a higher tolerance to pain overall. And if you talk mental, the whole perception of pain gets a little warped in in the moment. I've been doing this for a very long time, and I've heard thousands of stories, bad stories. I have never heard, ever heard, personally, right? I'm not saying it hasn't happened. I'm just saying that I have a lot of exposure to this world. Yes. I personally have never heard of a rape situation that was solved with a gadget. Right. Any any gadget, yeah, any gadget. So, um, yeah, and we've actually put some of these gadgets to the tests here. We have we have it on video, rape whistles and rape alarms. Right, because um, rape whistles is also something you're not a big fan of. Yeah, well, we've tested it. We just created a video where we tested uh, the the loudest rape alarm that we could find, you know, from one of the most well known companies that creates personal protection items, Uber, mm-hmm. and uh, we figured, okay, what will happen if a young woman deployed a rape alarm in the middle of the street when a man is standing really close to her and cornering her against the wall, right? So, mm-hmm. which is what's you know when you're when you're actually doing the rape alarm, right? Right. And um, so the whole thing is on video, but can you guess what happened? <laughs> nothing 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 <laughs> nothing happened we had probably 30 people pass us by from across the street from right next to us from next to it yeah it's an alarm it's an alarm in new york right yeah, that's all it is right, right. It's, there's it's nothing you, you know you got this beeping thing that is obnoxious to most people 
that noise does not create a sense of urgency to go rescue a woman in need at all. So even though some people passed within feet from us and saw mm-hmm. something that's weird because it's nighttime and I was the bad guy, all right? Oh, right? And I had like a hoodie on my head and a hat covering my head. That's and, I, and I basically kept her against a, against a, a, a door, like a wall, so she couldn't this. And I just stood in front of her in kind of like this menacing way. Right. I wasn't hitting her, but I was basically telling her, don't move or I will kill you. Shut that mm-hmm. thing off or I will murder you. Those are the things that I was telling her, which would, could be in reality real things. And that and were as, audible to other people. No, they were not because I was okay. telling it just to her. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm not stupid. I'm just crazy. No, because no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Because I'm a bad guy that actually, you know, I'm not. I'm going to sexually realistic. assault you right now. Right That's now. not how sexual assault right. sounds like. Okay. No, it's okay. quiet. Right. Right. It's not even that obvious usually in the middle of the street. It's even more hidden. But let's assume it is that obvious. And guess what? That thing was going on for five minutes and we recorded probably. 15 or 16 people that are in the video. We recorded more. We just, you know, we, you, you, you edit it. You cut it short just mm-hmm. to, to make a point. But in five minutes, nobody actually asked her if she needed help, uh, even though everybody heard the sound. So, hey, it doesn't work. And we did the same thing with the rape whistle. I had actually my wife be the female, and I was the bad guy. And we did it three times in three different locations to see if people are going to help her out. She was blowing the whistle for probably a minute at a time. No. And... Uh, Wow. And, Which you know, and, and, and there's a menacing person next to her. And with her, it was even more violent because what I did with her is I actually grabbed her and pulled her into an alley and she started whistling. No and way. we wanted to see if anybody's going to walk into that alley and come help her out. Right. And she can take it because she's a Krav Maga teacher, too. She's, and a, she's a, a badass. Yeah, a she's, crazy a, she's a fighter. dangerous yeah. person. Yeah, she's, she's unbelievable. <laughs> We're going to talk about her. We're going to talk about her in a bit and yeah. uh, your relationship. Um, but what we just talked about um, made me think of something else. So the point of intervention right, mm-hmm. is also a very important topic. So when you see something happening, so let's say a fight or a conflict or a sexual assault, when should you intervene? If you are 100% certain that you have the skill set to uh, sustain violence that will come your way because you intervene. That's the only time. The assumption during intervention, you have to assume that violence is going to turn your way. That's, that has to be the assumption. If you have the skill set and the confidence that if violence turn your way, you'll be fine, then you can, then I'll recommend to intervene physically. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't have that skill set, then you can intervene from far away, right? By calling the police, shouting to them that you're calling the police, but really far away, far away enough that you can run away and not get caught. Hmm. Yes, because people are often shamed because they don't intervene. Obviously, there's a difference between not intervening and filming something on your cell phone. Um, but so the things that you say you can do to intervene, but not physically intervene is to shout on the top of your lungs, call the police, whatever. Yeah, things yeah you can, you can, you can do, you can do those things. But in reality, I don't recommend to anybody to intervene until they have like physically intervene, right? Until they have been really well trained in violence coming their way. Um, and on the flip side of that, if you are a person, right, that is worried for their safety, do not count on anybody intervening to help you. The right. likelihood of uh, anybody jumping to your aid and being a hero is very slim. And every now and then you get to see some videos who you think that's reality, right? Like you get to see somebody intervening. I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. That's probably how things are. But those numbers are... Those are superhero scenarios. Those right? are superhero scenarios <laughs> that are so far and far in between, right? The right. vast majority of the people, they'll get it on tape. And in their mind, they're helping because they get it on tape. But mm-hmm. we all know, what does that do for the victim who's being victimized right now? Literally right. nothing. A woman was, was raped in, in Philadelphia, right? On the train, mm-hmm. 45 minutes. People are on the train. And no. she's, and she's been, yeah, this just happened like a month ago. And, and, nobody, and nobody helped her, even they though they were it. there. And they, some they of them, it? the police said that some of them took videos of it. None of the videos came out. Then they changed the story. They said there was no videos. Yes, there were videos. There's a lot of confusion whether or not videos were taken. But if there are witnesses and they're not doing anything about it, you can say, you know, they're terrible people or they're insensitive or they're whatever. But in in the end of the day, people are people. And people are going to do what is best for them and not for you. Mm -hmm. And if they are untrained, like you aren't, because you clearly you're in this victimizing position and you don't know what to do, then... um, Intervention might lead to them getting hurt. That, yeah, it, it will almost certainly lead to them getting hurt if they don't know what they're doing. Right. Just recently, you know, a good a good Samaritan 
This was in New York. This was in New York two weeks ago. A, a, a man was pushed in front of a subway mm -hmm. and a good Samaritan went to help him. And what ended up happening is that the good Samaritan got hit by the train and died. Mm -hmm. And the other person got also got hit by the train, but um, he got just injured. Right. So here's a case of intervention where, I mean, do you have the athletic skills to actually jump in front of a moving train, grab a person and take them to safety? That It requires strength and it requires speed and rather than like it, it requires a whole lot to make that decision other than just being a good person and for that good samaritan it cost him their life um and it's not you know and i can show you a million examples of of people that have the best intentions getting stabbed because they try to stop a robbery getting stomped on their face because they try to stop a, a racist comment that is happening getting mm -hmm. beat up because of, because of those things you cannot rely on confidence to get you through violence. Right. All right. That's the thing. I'm going to repeat it over and over again. You got to have a skill set to back it up. It's not very hard to get that skill set. Right. Because the work. adrenaline, even though you might feel adrenaline, it won't make you a superhuman. Right. Adrenaline. Yeah. yeah. So when we talk about fight or flight, what happens during fight or flight? Right. This is a this is a place our bodies go to when they are when we're scared or when we're excited or when we're ready. Um, or when, when we're threatened and our body gets this shot of adrenaline, which gets it ready for action. Mm -hmm. What adrenaline doesn't do is adrenaline doesn't teach you how to be a fighter and teach you how to have fight skills. If you have the fight skills, the adrenaline is going to sharpen them and it's going to make sure that you are hitting harder than probably than you could without the rush of adrenaline. And right. it numbs pain too. So if you get hit, it doesn't actually hurt as much during during the adrenaline rush. Uh, it hurts later. Yeah, when adrenaline goes away, then you feel the pain. But during the moment, you can sustain yourself with a skill set and, and the adrenaline is there to boost it. If you just get adrenaline and there's nothing for the adrenaline to activate, then you go, most people go into freeze where their heart rate is a hundred miles an hour and they haven't moved and they just mm -hmm. unfortunately yeah, because, accept the assault. Yeah. I was talking to a, uh, with a girlfriend the other day and I said, you know, I have always have the false sense of security that if something happens, I'll kill the, kill the person who tries something right. Or, in, yeah. or injure them, but you don't know what's going to happen. Adrenaline can also make you freeze. Yeah. So, well, the, que the next question was, how is you going, how are you going to kill him? Right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Like yeah, it's it, great. It's just said, yeah, sure. I want to do it. Yeah, exactly. I'm just but kill him. I okay. Good. How? How? <laughs> okay. Exactly. The, the how is a big piece. Now, if what we were talking about was only happening to like a very small group of people, then you know there's some violence and some stuff that we just contain as society. But reality today is, is one in five women is going to get sexually assaulted in the United States. Mm. One in five. Like that's, that's insane. Incredible. It's a <laughs> okay. That's insane. Number. One in four if you're in college. So these are not these are not like little things that should right. be contained. For some reason, there isn't enough public outcry over it. You know, we're the ones ringing the bell every day, and we're looking at the numbers literally every week because we run mm -hmm. uh, these specialized seminars every week. But we're looking at one in four if you're in college, right? Now you take mm -hmm. a look. Like I'm just looking at myself personally, right? I have a mom and a wife, and a daughter, and a sister. And every single one of them probably will be in college, okay? Some of them have been. My daughter is very small, so she's probably next, <laughs> okay? Statistically speaking, one of them is going to get sexually assaulted. Am I just okay with that? Like, who is who is that one? Is it my daughter, my wife? That's a fact you shouldn't ignore. Right? My, my mom, my sister. Yeah. You can't, right? That's the thing. So once you start looking at this, it is actually very personal to everybody because everybody can point to four or five women in their life that they will do anything to keep safe. Mm -hmm. But in the end, they actually, but they don't do anything to keep them safe. Right. Right. They don't do the training. They don't learn what to do if something bad happens. And, um, and if we, if women can get better equipped to handle themselves, it will reduce, it will reduce the demand to hurt women. Hmm. Right. Today, right. 97.5% of all rapists will never spend a day in prison, okay? That's a 97.5% chance of success of raping a woman and living a go-happy life right afterwards. Right. I almost don't want you to say it out loud. <laughs> well, but you, yeah, but you know who knows it best? The bad guys. <laughs> they, know it. <laughs> they know it better than anybody, and these numbers are public. And the reason that it's the case, right, there's the... There's, there's a few reasons for it. One is in the reporting aspect. Only 300 about, out of 1,000 is actually going to get reported mm -hmm. um, to the police. Others get reported to other organizations and social services, but the police only gets about 300. And then out of the 300, only 50 
are actually going to lead to an arrest. Mm-hmm. Out of that 50, only 28 are actually going to c- get convicted in court. So there's a whole justice system that fails women on a, on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. We started at 1,000, okay? We're down to 28 convicted. And out of the 28 convicted, only 25 would actually go to prison. So out of every 28, there's always going to be three that are going to plea out on some nonsense deal, you know, with the DA and spend their whatever at home. They'll go home or get some other slap on the wrist, but not prison. Mm. Um, and one of them, again, again, it also happened in it's just, just random. It's two separate cases, but it was also in Pennsylvania where a man just admitted in court, like guilty, and he was found guilty in court of multiple counts of rape in his home. Mm-hmm. And they just gave him uh, probation. That was it. Incredible. Yeah, and, and he wasn't in prison. So, 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 so how do you stop that? Okay? You can say... Well, the whole system needs to change, and men has to change, and the legal system has to change, and everything has to change. And there is room for that, but let's be real. How confident you are that the powers that be are actually going to change all that. Mm -hmm. What can you do as a person to make sure that you're just not a part of that statistics? Think selfishly, okay? Don't even think globally. Think selfishly. Right. If how you can, can, how can yeah. you change from a victim into a someone who's proactive? Exactly. How can you train? So if somebody decides that you're going to be one of those... You know, right now in New York, you have about 120 cases of sexual assault, of rape a week that's happening in New York and close to 500 sexual assault that mm. isn't rape because rape is a very narrow definition of in the world of sexual assault, right? So you're right. looking at about 500 women every week. So how do you make sure that if, if, if you are one of those 500 in that week, 2,000 a month, right? You see how, how astronomical these numbers get as you start yes. going. This is just New York. We're not even talking about the U.S. What can you do? Can you change the system on these numbers? I don't know. Maybe you are the one person in position of power that can do it. But if you're not in the position of power to do it, you, ha- you are in a position of power to change how you would be in that situation. Mm. What you know. And the first, the first step is to believe that you could actually hurt somebody else that's trying to hurt you mm. for the, just for the sake of getting away. But you will have to cause some damage on the other side. And if you believe that you can do it, then go ahead and take that skill set. To the next level. Yeah, yeah. Because right. it, it changes everything, right? Mm. You become so comfortable with human aggression once you start doing this, uh, this type of training that it affects, positively affect everything else. That's a question I have, though, because um, you train on punching bags. You guys have very realistic human punching punching bags. Right. But how... Can you prepare someone for actually, you know, hitting a real human being or just disabling a real human being or hurting So someone? there's levels to the game, right? So when people start training, they start training on human like punching bags, which is one directional. You're hitting the thing and the thing doesn't hit you back. Right. But that's the beginning. And then they move up to higher levels of once they are getting good at that, they move up to higher levels of training, which involve full contact, one on one contact, sparring, two on one, uh, ground fighting. And those things happen at full speed. But at that point, your skill set is so high that it's safe, right? Plus there's yeah. gear, you, you keep it safe. But once you get, once you get that skill set and you practice it full speed, full force against a, a, a resisting uh, human mm-hmm. and you're trained, when the crazy dude puts it on you, it actually feels easier because that person isn't trained. You know, most rapists don't actually know what they're doing technically, you know? Like their chokes aren't very technical chokes. They're still very dangerous. But they're not technical. They're very easy to break through. Maybe based on strength more than technique. It's 100% based on strength. Right. But technique and leverage and, um, and hitting soft spots and a bunch of other like technical stuff, they, they even out the playing field. And that's the beauty of Krav Maga. See, Krav Maga has no rules. There's no weight classes. It's designed specifically for the unfair world. Um, so those set of skills, they, they, we assume that the other guy is actually bigger and stronger. That's a part of the training. You don't assume that you're stronger than them. You assume that they are stronger and what you can do to break them. Matan, I want to talk uh, about you for a second. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is very uh, interesting, but I want to talk about okay. you and the way you manage your time and do all the different things that you do. Because you um, run Fit Hit, you're the CEO, you're the founder. Um, you've also uh, played in uh, several or starred in several movies. The latest one is Bruised with Hellberry. Um, you're also a trainer. How do you manage to do all those different things at the same time? Um, I uh, Well, one, uh, I look at my time as a very expensive, valuable thing. Um, And that's kind of like the beginning of the management of my time. I I like to plan out everything that I do uh, 
almost a year in advance where I have these things that need to be accomplished within a period of 12 months. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then it gets broken down into things that need to be accomplished every 90 days. And then it, that gets broken down into things that need to be accomplished every 30 days. And then that, that needs to be even more broken down into things that need to be accomplished every week. And then that needs to be broken down into the things that need to be accomplished every day. Mm. Nobody has time ever. If you really think about it, right? Mm. Nobody has time. Think, if you're a student, do you have time? No, you're busy all the time. If you take your being a student seriously, now what if you're what if you're what if you're a mom? What if you're a full time mom? You have time? You don't have time, right? It's crazy. What if you run a small business, right? That means you're probably working twenty hours a day trying just to like stay afloat. What if you run a big business? You mm -hmm. don't have time. What if you're an astronaut? You don't have time. Like, well, if you're like, at any level of the game, nobody has time, and it's because our brains are wired to constantly chew on something and constantly digest something from the minute we wake up. So our plate is always going to be full. For us to add another thing to it, which means create growth in our life, right? We want to add one more thing, another skill, or another experience, or another thing. Something needs to get off the plate. Something needs to get sacrificed in mm -hmm. order to have room for the next thing. So a part of my time management is a constant, not just adding things on and accomplishing more things, but also cutting things off. And sometimes it's relationships and sometimes it's, uh, it's entertainment and mm. sometimes it's social aspects that needs to be sacrificed because there's, in my mind, something bigger and more important. As a part of my mission, my personal mission and the mission of FitHit is to reduce victimization. And one of the ways we're doing that is to fight the victim mindset. Before there's the physical victimization, and sometimes after the physical victimization, people might find themselves in a victim mindset. It's a mindset that says that things are always going to be bad. There's nothing you can do about it. So why even try? It's external mindset, locus of control. It was big external locus of control. Exactly, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and we preach for a very high internal locus of control and we give people tools on how to increase their own locus of control. We test them before, we test them after. It's a whole system to get people moving on that, uh, on that scale to a more... Uh, to gaining control of everything that they can in their lives, but when it comes to when it comes to victim mindset, uh, we call them, you know, energy vampires, right? Because mm -hmm. they literally suck the energy from you. And there's always two ways to handle a relationship that is draining or not working. One way is to use something that I like to call recruitment is to recruit them and influence them for the better through support and mentorship mm. and give them a look through a different lens. If your lens is better than their lens, sometimes it's okay to just show them life through your lens in, in an, in a non-judgmental way. Mm -hmm. And also maybe introduce them to people in your circle that have similar lenses so they could see that, you know what, not everything is gloom and doom. Not everybody is doing bad. Not everybody is sick and dying. Not everybody, right? There is a- It's possible a, for me to be happy. <laughs> it's possible for, for people to be happy, yeah, yeah. right? So you have, so, so that's one, we call that recruitment, where you actually bring them into your mission. And recruitment has done wonders for me and for, for other people. It's because you end up getting support from the people that you, that you support, right? They end up supporting mm -hmm. you and it's great and you're moving upwards. Um, but if that doesn't work, then there is the X. That's the other tool. And the X is always there and it's always sharp. The metaphorical X that, that, uh, that cuts relationships right. that, that don't serve us a relationship that are causing more harm than good. Um, you know, internally we call that static. Okay. Like, you know, that, that noise, that's the, that static noise. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have relationships that are like static. They're just there and they're just noise and they add nothing. So the X is something that we uh, use and we teach our students to use that concept, mm -hmm. how to um, how to evaluate a relationship, if it's good, if it's bad. And if you come to the conclusion that it's not working, sever. And mm -hmm. it's great. It's just one of those things on the plate, right? Right. There's, there's things that need to be, that needs to be removed from the plate that we talked about earlier. Um, so yeah, so that's, it works well. I can tell you that it works well. Um, it reduces, anxiety it reduces negative emotions it reduces uh and it increases your likelihood of succeeding in whatever it is you want to succeed in okay like mm -hmm. if you're an entrepreneur or a creator of any kind or if you're in management feelings of sadness anxiety anger fear they're like dead weight on on people mm -hmm. that create on people that want to grow 
it's good to be aware of those things. It's good to be aware yeah. of who you surround yourself with and what you can do. Absolutely. Yeah. So control everything, including who you spend time with, what voices you listen to. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, what happened over the past couple of years with COVID, there's something, uh, it's, it's a little, little term term I coined, it's, I call it a, a group victim mindset. Uh, mm-hmm. Group victim mindset is when you have a large number of people all feeling victimized over the same thing, even though some of them aren't actually victimized. They just feel like they're supposed to be victimized because right. they share some characteristics with other people who's been victimized. So they, so they position themselves as a victim also. Right. I feel like it's also easier to feel like a victim than to be proactive and, you know. Yeah, there is a certain level of comfort when you're being constantly comforted, mm-hmm. right? right? Yes. Oh, poor you, can I make life better for you? Blah, blah, blah. There's comfort in that, so people will sink into that. Mm-hmm. It's terrible. I think it's... it's uh, it's probably one of the worst swings of the pendulum that we've been seeing in shift shift in human behavior over the past 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but it has its costs, and I'm sure that it will return to, you know, a, a more proactive approach to living as, as opposed to... Uh, and so yeah. um, talking about people you surround yourself with, because you went from, you know, you were, were a trainer first, you were a Krav Maga expert first, uh, then you went to founding your company. And these are skills that don't just happen, you know, overnight. You actually have to train for them, learn from them, etc. Yeah. They need to be taught. How much do you value sort of expert training? And how do you, how do you approach training? So do you learn from the experts? Do you go to the source or do you... Um, go to the source student student, for example. First of all, I want to say that I love coaching uh, in general. I, I believe in the power of coaching. I think that finding the right coach is one of the biggest time saver and money saver that you can get. How deep do I go is a question of how much I can afford. You know, I'll spend the most on getting the, on the highest level of coaching that I can that I can get that I can qualify to, and uh, and I can tell you like in the in the very beginning so like you know, from, from my own experience right so, so I, I came here with nothing I came here with seven hundred dollars I lived in basements you know it's like I lived in boiler rooms I literally had nothing I had a small little bag with you know five items in it and that was it that was my that was my life mm-hmm. and I had to literally dollar to dollar you know you know kind of build my, myself up and be able to afford. The life that I've managed to afford, but I can tell you that the very early piece of advice that I got from, you know, I was in this, I was in this gym and I was, uh, I was just eating lunch and this guy that was responsible for marketing, he was an older guy, like he's been around for a minute, and he always shows up in a suit and tie to a gym. It's hilarious, you know, because he sees himself as, you know, as the business guy, so he dresses for business, right? And I'm just there eating my subway sandwich, which I had every day for a year and a half. Um, <laughs> And he tells me, I want to give you one piece of advice, Matan. Always have lunch with somebody that makes more money than you. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard that little piece of advice at age 21 <laughs> or age 22. And I decided that if I'm going to eat lunch with somebody, it's always with somebody that makes more money than me. And I can tell you that just going through that, and I couldn't afford coaching and training or anything back there. But just being around people that have done more than you mm-hmm. and hanging out with them and talking to them. You pick up things, right? You pick up things that you didn't know. And you also pick up things, more importantly, that you didn't know you didn't know. Mm. What, what do I mean by you don't know you don't know? You don't even have the skill set to ask the question to get the answer. And some of the greatest breakthroughs in my life happened when I was exposed to information I didn't know I didn't know. I was exposed to information that I didn't even have the skill set to ask or to go through the research to find the answer. Because, because it was so to. left field. Yeah, it was so beyond my scope, my lens. And I keep talking about lenses, right? Mm-hmm. But we don't all see this. We can all look at the same things, but we all see different things, mm-hmm. right? If you're a small business operator and you're looking at another small business, you're going to see certain things. But if you are a small business operator that grew their business to become a public company, you're going to look at that same business. You're going to see different things. You're going to see different opportunities. You're going to see different issues that needs to be fixed, different mm. uh, different places of growth, right? You go into another level, the people who fund those transactions and they look at that same business and they see different things, right? And they get different. So what I'm saying is the lens keeps increasing and increasing. And what I found is the more I expose myself to people that, that have bigger lenses than my own in my 20s, mm-hmm. 
I, I managed to skip stages, right? I didn't have to make mistakes that I was obviously going to make um, right. because of that. And, and when I was available, when I was able to start buying this type of coaching, I usually, I pay a premium to learn it fast and right to get it the first time. And every time I did it, it paid off in multiples. And how would you do that if you don't have, because you just explained that you didn't have the resources to begin with. So what would you, so what would your advice be to someone who doesn't have the resources, but does want to learn something from the source? So we moved spaces because of sound or noise constraints. We were talking about what advice you could give to people who don't have resources that do want to learn from the source. Okay, so what I would recommend is to get, uh, so there's cheaper access to information, right, than just paying a really high level coach. Um, there's, there's terrific books out there that can get you started with, uh, uh, with understanding how things work that are beyond you. Um, mm -hmm. There are some online courses and recordings that, you know, depending on what it is that you want to learn, right? You can start lo looking at the research and then looking at who the person is that created and developed that material. And if you find them credible, then um, then you should get and invest in it. Um, I can I can probably be the first to, to attest that, you know, put as much as you can into it, right? Into, into whatever it is that you want to learn. Right? You want to learn how to defend yourself. You want to learn how to be more fit or you want to learn how to run a business, how to run a company, how to how to become a leader or manager. Right? See, the answers are there. And the return on that investment is usually, is usually worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember the first time I ever, I ever purchased uh, any type of coaching, it was very, very expensive. It was, it was much more than I felt comfortable. It was, uh, it was very expensive back then, right? Back, it was, mm -hmm. was $16,000 and I didn't even have that money in cash. I had to for what kind of training? For Krav Maga training? No, or for, no, oh. Krav Maga. I don't pay anybody to teach me Krav Maga. <laughs> People pay me a lot to teach me Krav Maga. Yeah. We came out of the womb. <laughs> yeah, and no, I, I, I started when I was, you know, a very young child. Probably started martial arts before I could read. No way. Yeah, so I started very, very young. So that's um, I'm, I'm good on, I'm good on that. I'm good on that part. Yeah, no, but when I started uh, increasing my business, I needed to learn. Uh, things like marketing, things like online marketing, and, and you know these are usually things that that they were, it was out of my scope of things that I re, that I knew how to do well. You know how to get people to know who I am and understand what value I bring to the world and would want to also spend money to get that to get that value. So at a certain point, you want to start growing faster than you have, and that's where marketing come into play. You know, I had to spend sixteen thousand dollars to learn how to do it, and I didn't have sixteen thousand dollars, so I had to negotiate. You know, breaking it down. You know, making the money in return, and making the money in return, and payment you know, plan or something. Yeah, but that sixteen thousand quickly turned into I don't know, just, from just the thing I took from there it went from sixteen grand to like seven figures in return. So it's like okay. Right, so you have to invest in yourself. That's a, that's what it is. Right? Part of that also because you wrote a book. Mm -hmm. Was it because you wanted to increase credibility or was it because you wanted to understand your craft better? What was your motivation for that? Yeah. I guess it's a little bit of everything. There was definitely the increase, uh, the increased credibility when you when you write something and it's there and it's and it's always going to be there. Right. So mm -hmm. I have if I have a, a message in my book, it's, it's actually my book is very it's a very simple self-defense tutorial book. Right, it's it's mostly images with a little bit of words. It just shows you how to escape the most common attacks mm -hmm. uh, that they are, and it's geared specifically towards women who are just more more likely to get attacked, so they're most likely to get value from uh, from that book. And I wanted to create more than one way to engage with me and my content in a way that's available to everybody, right? Because right. um, I don't do a whole lot of training of other people, right? I trained an entire staff to do the, the, the training for me. And they're doing an unbelievable job because they're all professionals even before they met me. So we know we have a great product to do it, but okay, but somebody wants to learn exactly how I do it. So that would be a really cheap way to, to, to get, get started, to get started. Yeah. And then, you know, there's the next level, right? I also created a full online academy where people can get tutorials by video, hundreds of video tutorials mm -hmm. that I teach. And that's way cheaper than to get me to go and teach them how to do it, right? You can just log in and see and learn from that uh, and grow, right? And then there's the next level of actually showing up at our studios, uh, at our facilities, New York or Los Angeles and mm -hmm. uh, whatever we're going to open up uh, going into the future. 
and uh, and you can do it like that. And then even on top of that, there is the remote aspect of what we do, right? Because we actually all of our classes are being streamed uh, live and on demand to everybody in the world. So that's another way that they can get in, in touch with me. So the book was a creation of just one more outlet for the message mm-hmm. um, that hopefully people will get it, learn something. And if it ends up helping them in any way, that's, uh, you know, a good day for everybody. You just you just talked about your future plans for FitHit. What are your, you know, 10 year plans? FitHit in, in my head is a global mission. Um, and there is room for a FitHit in every city in every neighborhood in ev- everywhere that you can see violence against women there is a place for fit hate there uh, we actually hold the solution to that so the growth of fit hit is going to be is going to be basically fueled by human nature and its destructiveness right so as long as bad people, people do bad yeah. things right right there will be a room for FitHit to teach the people that don't want to get hurt by these people what to do and how to behave. And at the same time, get fit, because the way FitHit does it is very different than other than other martial arts school. FitHit is a, is a fitness community first. So people would come here in order to get fit, you know, lose weight, tone up, build muscle, get their uh, aesthetics uh, to where they like it and their performance to where they like it. And the tool that we use is that Krav Maga skill set. Um, and what we find is that when it's a package like that, that it's a 360 degree package that takes a look at every aspect of your life, including mental fortitude, mm. then it is then it becomes easier for people who don't actually want to fight right. to, to go and fall in love with it. And that's and so when you're looking into the future, right, that type of, of, uh, of packaging had to be created if, if it's going to get multiplied. And this is um, this is where we are now. Right now, we're in the process of, uh, you know, looking into new markets and looking into new in- investment opportunities um, with with investors to really to grow this thing to become massive, massive both brick and mortar and massive mm-hmm. di- digital footprint as well. Well done. Our time is up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Terrific. Uh, for being here, really appreciate it. Thank you, Kate. Appreciate it. <laughs>